So folks, welcome to episode 250 of the Alamo Audible Podcast. 250 is a big number. It's a nice round number, halfway to 500. This is your host, Jared Kalmus, joined as always by my co-host, Adrian Bermudez. Adrian, how are you feeling on this uh, episode number 250? I've got a mix of emotions, Jared, after uh, yeah. 250 episodes and game one of the 2024 UTSA campaign. And so we're going to get into all of it. There's there's several things to gripe about if you were watching that game with the expectations that we had going into it. But there's a lot of things to be very excited about, namely the play of UTSA's new starting quarterback, Owen McGowan. And uh, we're going to get into the good, the bad, the ugly here today. Um, Jared, I think just overall, safe to say, there's a lot of work, a lot of improvement that needs to be done on this team if they're going to live up to their potential. And um, it's it's really a matter of how quickly can they correct their mistakes because the schedule gets very difficult, very fast, going into the two-week stretch, Texas State and University of Texas at Austin the next two weeks. Yeah, as I was reflecting on the game, I, I, I think the reaction from the fan base coming out of it is a huge um, – statement about where the expectations are at for this team mm, yeah you know, like beating another fbs team but what was it 12 points i think was the, the final talent yeah be, beating another fbs team by 12 points with a new starting quarterback three new starting offensive linemen you know et cetera, et cetera, on and on and on it's just not good enough for this fan base anymore and uh you know i think that's a good thing overall but i've been a little surprised to see uh i guess like the outpouring of negativity uh, from the from the fan base, like from the media, the national people, and all of that, uh, it feels a little bit over the top. And I'm I'm usually the more you know kind of pragmatic, you know, even kill one. Uh, so it's I feel it's like opposite day where like I I am like much more encouraged. I think than most people are with what I saw from the Roadrunners, because uh, for me, like I think most of the stuff we're going to talk about as far as negative goes is stuff that is very correctable, right? Um, I saw a really good football sure. team out on the field. And uh, felt that way in the stands. And then when I went back and rewatched the game and did my film breakdown, I, I felt even more assured that this team has what it takes to compete for conference championship. But the team that showed up on Saturday is not the one that's going to go do that. It's going to be a much improved team that will have to, you know, put in the work to get to that point. You saw a completely raw, completely unmolded, brand new from scratch. This is hardly a ball of dough yet of the UTSA Roadrunners. It's brand new. And this was their very first go at it. But I think, you know, fans who watch the game to be disappointed in how they won is fine, considering the plethora of errors, errors that occurred by way of 10 penalties for 109 mm -hmm. total yards for Kennesaw State. It's not how you start. It's how you finish that people remember. You started hot, 21-0, to moving the ball really well. No one remembers that after you go stagnant yeah. for, yeah. gosh, I didn't even do the, the regulation math, but until four minutes remaining in the fourth quarter, uh, UTSA fans were highly concerned and a little bit even scared about them dropping this game in dramatic upset fashion. And I was fine. It was a one possession game, even down to four minutes remaining in regulation in the fourth quarter. Yeah, dude, uh, it was it was sloppy. But ultimately, you saw a very immature team out there. And so with that becomes a lack of discipline, high emotion. Uh, those two things, I think, were probably the most evident when it came to the sloppiness that UTSA presented. And it's just immaturity. It's immaturity of snaps. They don't have the snaps yet. They don't have the in-game experience yet. That's going to come. But golly, it's got to happen quick for a team that, all fall camp has been talking about college football playoff expectations, game of consequences. You don't have a margin for error. And Jared, I think that also contributes to fans' irateness. You know, they, mm -hmm. they feel all this pressure from this UTSA Roadrunners, be it fairly or unfairly, to a new starting quarterback and a new receiving core. But it is what it is. Yeah, and I think Texas State looming this week has a lot to do with the fan reaction as well. I, I don't think people trust – uh, Coach Trailer and his staff to get this team turned around quickly enough to be able to go on the road and beat, you know, a Texas State team that returns, you know, majority of their starters from last season. Um, so I think there's also the anxiety aspect that makes it worse. But too, I mean, another thing that I've been thinking about too is I, I just don't think the fan base and, and maybe even the team itself, you know, those around it 
gave Kennesaw State the respect that they deserved around this game, right? I think everyone mm-hmm. is convinced it was going to be a total cupcake, you know, 49 to zero or, or whatever, right? Uh, you know, my prediction was 34 to 14, right? So even me having one of the most pessimistic projections out there that I saw from anyone, even I uh, was still too high as far as the spread goes, right? So um, I, I just think, I think the Kennesaw State defense was really good, right? And I, I think people are too quick to be like, oh my God, the running game is busted. Oh my God, this offensive line is going to suck. Uh, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, right? But like, let's keep in mind, like we don't really know what Kennesaw State is going to look like on week 12, right? They could end up, you know, they won't be bowl eligible because they're transitioning, right? But they could make a lot of noise at Conference USA. And we could look back on, you know, having a 12 point win against them as something that, you know, wasn't a stellar success by any means, but something that makes sense in the context of the season. So um, I liked a lot of what I saw from that Kennesaw State defense. I think they're going to make some noise this year and probably not win a whole lot of games, but they're going to be very stingy and they're going to they're going to play tough. Look, before we get into all of the things that sort of went wrong for the Roadrunners and what went well for Kennesaw State in that game, I think it, it would be unfair to talk about what should be the larger storyline here, and that is the play of UTSA's new starting quarterback, Owen McGowan, in his very first home start. Taking the helm clearly is QB1. He played every single offensive snap. There was never any Eddie Lee Marburger. UTSA could not afford to go to their backups. Yes. That, that's Owen one of McGowan. the big downsides of the game. Like They still played you know, half the roster, probably, but not being able to get Eddie out there and get have some reps to you know get him ready if needed. Wish Hurt, more of the skill sure. positions could have came out. Wish, wish more of the skill positions could have came out. Yeah. But Owen McGowan, absolute stud, perfect, 28 for 38. 28 for 38 passing, 340 yards, three touchdowns. It's an 8.9 yard com- completion average, uh, zero turnovers, zero interceptions. Um, and, and even his misses, none of them were very scary in the sense that it was in a defender's direction, but it was misses by small little pieces. Uh, but in the receiver's vicinity, he was getting the ball into the general mm-hmm. area where you wanted to see it thrown. He just, you know, maybe couldn't zip it right there on the line where he needed to on some very difficult, more advanced throws you only saw that on. His worst throw of the game. Yeah, his worst throw of the game was probably that RPO, uh, like kind of peak slant, right, where where Devin went to the end zone and and cut to the inside of the field. Uh, Owen rifled that ball when he probably should have laid it up. You know what I mean? Uh, But it it still hit the receiver in the hands. It was just like kind of an uncatchable ball. And that was his worst throw, right? I mean, that that was fantastic. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Adrian, I want to point out too. I just realized that Owen had 340 passing yards. Mm-hmm. Will Henderson's 65 yard touchdown run was a forward pass, so he would have had 405 passing yards if it weren't for that questionable holding call on Oscar Hernandez. Sure. sure, and look, and he gives you a perfect game. It's a hat trick with zero interceptions, mm-hmm. and it's and it's 28 and for 38. For and ran for one, and ran for one. He showed us some beautiful wheels, a great stride on Ole McGowan. Clearly, uh, it's a little bit of dual threat there. Can at least see the field and will take the opportunity, won't hesitate to run the ball whenever he needs it. Got you some first downs, got you a touchdown with his legs. Dare I say Dalton Sturm-esque with a little bit of that running and throwing ability and uh, breaking out of a pocket that was collapsing a little bit quickly, knowing what to do in that situation. He showed a natural sort of ability to do that, and, and it was nice to see Owen. Look, man, he connected on some big balls. He went uh, 61 yards, Robert Henry, uh, Willie McCoy on a 45-yarder, Oscar Cardenas on a 35-yarder. So ball was really flying around. He moved it all over the field. I haven't seen the distribution chart, but I'd imagine it was well done, well-placed mm-hmm. ball, um, equally placed balls for for Owen. And the guy was just – he was fantastic leading this offense, Jared, despite having a lot of things go wrong. He was really fantastic, and uh, I, I'm excited – Robert yeah, McGowan, and, and, he looked like a real offensive leader out there. And pretty much no support from the running game too, right? So that, that makes it even more impressive. It's one thing to rack up passing mm-hmm. yards when, uh, you know, the running game is just killing it, right? Um, so when that's not the case and you got to bring more, you know, put more on your shoulders, I was very impressed. But for me, the, the number one most encouraging takeaway, and we had talked about this in one of our uh, preseason episodes, right, is we felt like Owen was going to have a really good command of the offense, right? That he was going to know the playbook. He was going to know the check downs. He was going to know the reads. He was going to have, you know, the ability and willingness to audible. We did see him do that a couple of times during the game. And I think it was the opening drive. They got down to like the two or three yard line 
Um, Kennesaw State was not lined up, right? Like they they had some serious red zone defense struggles, especially in the first half. So I don't know what exactly Owen saw, I, but he definitely saw man coverage on Devin McEwen and whoever the other receiver next to him was, right? So who knows what the original play call was, but Owen went up to the line and he audibled and he, you know, had them do like a crossing route. Devin McEwen, man coverage, you got a little rubber out action right there, got him wide open, right? So to see him, you know, step up and make that call to the line of scrimmage was was awesome and super encouraging um, because UTSA runs, you know, a pretty complex offense, right? A lot of RPO stuff. Um, so there are going to be times that you don't have the matchup that you want. You don't have the coverage look that you want. So he's going to have to, you know, make some calls to the line and, and make some good decisions. And we saw just that from him. Well, on top of that, Jared, how about just Devin and Owen have some – synergistic yeah. energy just right off the bat showing very very clearly his uh his number one guy on the day 11 yard uh, 11 catches for 79 yards uh two touchdowns over there to Devin and after the game in his post game interview Devin actually tells reporters when they ask him about their synchronicity I quote I love him as a quarterback quote unquote nice so pretty awesome to hear uh, after the very first start at the uh, first home start at the helm for Owen to have his number one guy telling him that he loves him. Oh, that's my quarterback. That's my yeah. quarterback. <laughs> you know, in, oh, in Devin's post game interview, <laughs> in Devin's post game interview, one of the reporters asked him, like, you know, what was it like having such a big game and, you know, stepping into the focal point of the offense for the passing game? And he was like, oh, you know, it's nice to do my job. But it's not like Owen was just staring at me all the time. And then I went back and watched the film. I was like, uh, maybe a little bit. Maybe there were a, a, a few plays where he did force the ball to Devin, and it was a good, successful play. Um, but, like, the other side of the field had a guy that would have got more yardage, right, if he would have looked over that yeah. way. So, yeah. you know, that'll, that'll come with time, right? And it's not like he was forcing balls into bad spots that had the potential to be intercepted or anything like that. Uh, but I do hope he builds that same chemistry with some other receivers as well to to spread the ball out. Like, let, let's not forget DJ Allen's an East Texas kid as well, right? <laughs> There's other East Texas kids that he can have that Barney Woods connection with. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Love to see it. So UTSA on the first three drives from scrimmage goes up 21 points. At halftime, it's 21 to 6 road runners. 311 total offensive yards from UTSA versus just – 93 yards of offense from Kennesaw State. Uh, UTSA seems to have things gelling, sort of flame out there a little bit at the end of the first half. Fans aren't thinking much of it. Um, you know, you have a punt. There's a fumble from Kavorian Barnes that's a little bit concerning. And then there's a shanked field goal from Chase Allen from, uh, I mean, it was pretty far. I think it was a 49-yard out. He probably only got it about 20 yards. Yeah, I think uh, he just missed in, like 44 and 49 or something like that. Yeah, so so there's an ugly sequence there, and um, and you know there's reasons for that. You know, there's is a ugly kick and also a, a new holder relationship happening. But aside from just that, you have this this big sort of gap between the way UTSA is executing, the way Kennesaw State is executing. Everything seems to be well in the land of Roadrunners. We've had some mental lapses, but it just seems like a little bit of a lull after scoring three touchdowns on your first three drives to start the season. Before we get to the second half, though, I mean, I do want to call out that 49 yard field. If assuming it was 49 in the end of the half, it might have been the 44 yard. I don't know, but that's within range for Chase Allen, right? So yes, if, you're, if sure. we're just yeah, evaluating the offense, right? We saw Jeff Trailer use timeouts really aggressively on Kennesaw State's last possession of the first half, um, held them to a field goal. I think that was the same play where Elliott Davidson had that crazy hustle play uh, to go and stop that screen pass that was almost a for sure touchdown. Uh, so they got the stop there. They held them to three points. And then I was, you know, I, I very much could tell like Jeff was intentionally trying to get to the two minute drill just to have Owen go and get those reps in, in a game time situation. I thought Owen did mm -hmm. fantastic, right? Leading the team. I think it was like one minute, 30 seconds on the clock when they started or something like that. Uh, he attacked yeah. the sidelines well. They called that classic white cross play to Cardenas, you know, the same one that he um, got down the field for in the 2022 Conference USA Championship game. And uh, it looked beautiful. Uh, he had a chance to score on that one, right? And, you know, I, I put in my film recap too. The way that he played out last year, he's not even an open on that play, right? So to, to see mm -hmm. him become part of not just the passing offense again, but the deep downfield passing attack was really awesome, right? Now, yeah, it was Owen, interesting. Owen did mess up, right? He did miss a hot route. Like there was a blitzer coming off his blindside edge that he missed pre-snap. Um, so, you know, not perfect, but Owen did the job of executing the two-minute offense. He put the offense in the position to get points in a very limited amount of time, right? So that was great to see. Yeah, but it was uh it was it was weird 
trailer kept saying that we couldn't get the ball downfield, but I recall like three big passes from Owen where they did get the ball downfield a lot. But trailer said in his presser that they couldn't get it downfield. I don't know if he was talking about a bigger pass than that, but I mean, there was a point there where, you know, through the mistakes, Owen would just snap the ball in the next play and, and sort of get UTSA out of it. You have horrible fielding, just a real mental lapse on a, on a punt return from Chris Carpenter, where he actually downs a punt at the UTSA three yard line. Uh, UTSA's yeah. got 97 yards of field in front of him, and Owen McGowan, Owen McGowan finds Willie McCoy 45 yards downfield, just boom, next play, money, puts it right there mm-hmm. for him, and no one remembers the punt, and no no one remembers the bad field. Yeah, sure, true. I, I kind uh, of agree with Jeff on that, right, because the Robert Henry completion, uh, that, that was a swing route to the running back, right? That, that was not a, a strike downfield. Correct. So I, that was I agree with Jeff. We, we, we only really saw two successful completions of, of more than 20 plus yards through the air. It was maybe Oscars, the one. Yeah. Maybe Oscars the one to Allen. Mm. Yeah. That one to Allen might've been, that was like medium range. I guess. I don't think but, that was 20. I don't think that was a 20 yard. Yeah. I don't think so. So that, that was one of my takeaways, right? Um, I, it was 29 DJ Allen, 29 yards. It was a 29 er. Yeah. Part, part of it was yards. the scheme, right? Like Kennesaw was playing very, very aggressive on defense. They were blitzing a ton. Um, so there just was not going to be time to sit in the pocket and, and have, you know, six to eight guys blitzing you and, you know, throw it 40, 50 yards downfield. Right. Um, so, but I, I still would have liked to see the pass protection be better. We're going to talk about that more later in the show, but that's one thing I'll be looking to see, right? Like you're probably not going to be able to do much against Texas state either. Cause they blitz like every play, um, uh, pretty aggressively, but against a more conservative defense, right. I do want to see if Owen can take the, take the top off the defense because we didn't even really get a chance to see what the speed of this receiver group can do downfield because there just was not time to look down there. It was a horrible pocket for Owen for a majority of the night. <laughs> Owen still managed to have an incredible day despite the pocket. I'm going to push back on that. I'm going to push back a little bit on that. I thought the pocket was pretty clean for the most part, but sometimes but was... there are free blitzers, right? Like when I rewatched the game, the one-on-one battles UTSA was winning. Right, it, it was super rare to see them actually get beat by a blitzer. They were going to beat by guys that weren't picked up, right? So mm. to me, that's like two different things, right? So okay. I, I don't think Owen had like this terrible pocket to pass out of for most of the game, but he took those sacks because guys were getting free because they weren't picked up in the line at all. Well, it just felt like that he had less time to work with than he would have liked on a lot of those. Yeah. And Jeff Trailer is something he talked about in his interview since the game was you, we just didn't keep that. He's he. he credits to one of the reasons why they couldn't get the ball downfield is because Owen didn't have enough time. We couldn't get right. him enough right. time. He didn't have yeah. the time. And it just felt like the pocket was collapsing quickly on him um, a lot more well, than when the defense is sitting six guys to blitz, you, you're never going to have the chance to sit back sure. there. Right? Sure. You still have enough guys. Sure. So. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's one of the things that I think um, snowballed into UTSA's big, bad lull and, just extreme downturn through three and a half quarters in this yeah. game after going up 21 to six at halftime. Um, and uh, can we be quite honest with you, Jared? Penalties are happening all game long. Mm-hmm. And this is, again, 10 penalties for 109 yards. This is the highest number of penalties trailers had in a season opener since his first year at UTSA. Wow. Where he had 11 against, guess who? Texas State. Yeah. Um, also, a game that he was debuting a lot of new players as well. Yeah, absolutely having a new roster. And yep. so but this this was a, a big mental lapse, I think. When and so when we talk about it was a sloppy, it was an immature game. The the penalties very immature because a lot of them were two things, we'll put in Jeff Trailer's words, uh lack of discipline or emotional control. And uh pre snap is lack of discipline, post whistle is emotional control, lack of uh, emotional control. And so we saw a lot of that pre-snap and post-snap penalties from UTSA, lack of emotional control and the lack of discipline. That's just immaturity. Um, Not being able to play through those mistakes. You can have one or two of those, but then you get over them, you shake them off, and you're tighter on the next drive, the next series or so. We saw it sort of hang around and linger, bother UTSA players for the better part of 75% of this game. Uh, and so with those penalties, that's whenever you see 
the line of scrimmage sort of getting beat up a little bit or a collapsing pocket. That's where you see the lack of the lack of stops, the lack of coverage on defense. Uh, that's where you see the misfires happening on offense, and all of that sort of snowballs for UTSA. And and it looked really ugly for the fan watching for three quarters. And and Jared, that's again where you get that distaste for week one yeah. of UTSA. Yeah, I mean, two, like two things, right? So first off, real quick, while you were talking, I went and pulled uh, the 2022, sorry, the 2020 schedule to see how many penalties they committed the week after Texas State, hoping to see a huge improvement. They still committed mm. seven penalties the following week against SFA, right? So it was not completely cleaned up in the next mm. game. It took them a couple games to get it under control. Mm. So keep, keep an okay. eye on that this week. Um, but <laughs> oh, also, baby, baby. I, I'm going to keep it real with you, Chief. If UTS had five penalties, this game's a blowout. And and the only people that are being, you know, any way critical uh, about the performance are going to be the sickos like us, right? I 100% agree with you that the, the penalties made the game look sloppy. And it was like, a, obviously, anyone who knows football is like, this is not good football right now. But also the score would have been a blowout, 100% with five penalties, yeah. right? The defense yeah. was stifling, right? Like, if you take UTSA's penalty yardage and you consider that like progression yards uh, for Kennesaw State's offense, well, like 40% of their progression yardage was from UTSA penalties. You know, you know what I mean? Like it would have been a complete blowout without penalties, right? They extended so many drives with those penalties. There were so many like third and 13, third and 15 stops that UTSA, you know, swatted the ball away or it was a bad pass. Well, guess what? Roughing the passer, right? And they get another go, right? So you, you take half of those penalties away tone around the program is completely different but maybe it's a good thing because i think it was humbling for the team no i'd much rather than yes, have, Jared. you know this oh. mindset going into texas state week that if they would have won 45 to 7 this is something that you saw really really echoed throughout the pressers look coach trailer has been visibly frustrated since that game ended yeah. uh he was pretty down he was pretty wound up a little tight in that post game presser yeah and uh yeah. definitely even still lingering into the monday so round table kind of had... i thought he was more yeah, i more think so upset too. Today. Yeah, yeah after yeah. you watched the film maybe he got even a little more under his skin yeah dude he's, yeah i, he I, can't, remember, not there, I can't remember which question was there was one question where he he had a really set set for a minute because like putting myself in his head he was like I'm going to sound really bad if i say my real thoughts right now so oh, like, yeah. i'm gonna i'm gonna process it oh. a little bit you know yeah, he credit was him, def- he's really improved a lot on that. You know, the Jeff from two years ago would have gone off the cuff and said something would have got him on football scoop and it would have gone viral. He, so, he even, had had moments, Jeff. even had moments where like he started his answer a little more aggressively and then like elaborated into a softer tone after he sort of realized, hey, I kind of got to put some padding on this. Um, but yeah, he's been frustrated, man. And so have the players. Everyone being asked about their game has said, look, it's it's not our best football. We know we're better than that. We know we have to do better than that. Um, we made a lot of mistakes. Jeff Trailer knows they made a lot of mistakes. Um, he spoke about a couple of things, Jared, two things that I'm not sure if you've caught or not, but I wanted to ask you if you did. He, he did say that Kennesaw State, in regard to the run game, UTSA's run game, did a good job of scheming things up that we've done in the past um, as if they were ready for a lot of the looks that they saw from UTSA on the ground. Yeah, probably so. They didn't, in my eyes, they didn't do anything new in the run game. They, they were pretty okay. vanilla there for sure. Some of the stuff in the passing game, I, th- I thought like maybe we're not new wrinkles, but it was like a little bit expanded from just, you know, your typical, you know, five plays that you, you know, have on a, a play sheet or whatever. But yeah, the run game definitely very vanilla, but I, I don't think that really should matter much, right? Like you okay. should be able to run inside zone, outside zone, power, counter and run those four yeah, plays and have 150 200 rushing yards pretty much every game considering considering who you have at running back yes you're absolutely right and yeah. so i think that's a big concern is how poorly the running backs were uh only 76 total yards on 34 carries uh, less than two and a half yards per carry from utsa's running backs really really miserable um jeff trailer said something else in that presser jared he said owen got spooked uh he said that he can't turn the Mike or Sam or Sam linebacker loose. Um, whenever he's talking about, it seems like he was saying Owen can't allow for what you're probably talking about the blitzing linebacker to get loose. Is that something he's got to be able to spot? Is Jeff Trailer talking about him being able to need to spot that, um, or does Jeff Trailer need to do a better job and tell him in his earpiece he's got to spot? Like where's where's the where's the reference he's making actually? 
in most cases, the responsibility of identifying the Mike linebackers with the center, right? So the the Sam is usually the running back that's staying in for pass protection, is my understanding, right? But the quarterback still has a responsibility as well, as well of like knowing where the blitz is coming. And I thought Owen was good at that, but he definitely made mistakes as well. But to me, the most egregious stuff is where they had guys come from the inside completely unchecked, right? So um, I thought CJ James had a really poor showing in his first start, unfortunately, as a roadrunner. And I'm still really high on him, right? He's a vet. He's going to get that stuff fixed. It's unusual errors for him if you see what he did at New Mexico. But I think I thought that was like the most concerning part of the passing game, right? Is like having those guys come free of the A gap. There's nothing that Owen can really do in that situation to to save himself or save the play, right? But um things that Owen can do, right? Like there was a time where there were three guys looked on that they were gonna blitz all off the left edge and Owen should have seen that and he should have thrown to the hot route there and he didn't, right? He stepped back mm. and um, I think he was looking for Devin on the other side over there, and that was covered, right? So uh, it's a mix, right? But you know, you should uh, you're all, you're always going to have quarterback miss a, a couple blitzes here or there, right? Uh, but you want to give the quarterback enough time that they can recover from that. And sometimes it was just so fast that he didn't even have the chance. Yeah, definitely so. Yeah, and, um, and so- too, you know, also you know another thing that O can do as far as a check, you know, an audible goes right is in that situation where he sees three guys blitzing. And he has a running back staying in the block. He can also tell that running back to release and then throw to that running back, right? So that's something they're definitely gonna have to do against Texas State this week. They're gonna, you know, go like unbalanced blitz, send three guys on one side, right? And like, there's, you're not gonna have the the people in place to pick up all those blitzes. So you have no choice but to send the running back out and and try to get the ball to him. So uh, it'll be interesting mm-hmm. to see if UTSA does more of that in this coming week. Okay, interesting. I like to see coaches and players visibly frustrated with their performance, even in a win. You make yeah, a good a point about fans win. having the expectation yeah. too. It's a double digit win, but one that you made mistakes that you shouldn't have. And I think that's where the disappointment mm-hmm. stems from. I think from both sides, from within the program and outside of it. Yeah, no doubt. We had way too much lack of emotional control on those post game penalty, on those personal fouls, post whistle penalties, post play. Those happen way too often. You can't afford to have that many especially in a game without any consequence. And I think that's what's so bothersome, Jared. You have nothing personal. You have no biff. You have absolutely no reason to have so much pent-up aggression towards a team like Kennesaw State. You should be in there doing your business, worrying about getting your reps in, taking care of your business every single play. You're in San Marcos. They're screaming loud. It's a rivalry game. You feel like the playoffs on the line. You see the line being one and a half favored towards Texas State. Yeah, now you're pissed off and you're playing in your head. I can understand you're getting chippy. But Kennesaw State, man, you can't afford to have that happen. And if you had it happen that many times against the Kennesaw State, how bad is it going to be next week and emotions are actually involved? In a game with no emotional ties, you have 10 penalties. Um, you hate to see it. You're right, Jared. Half that amount of penalties, UTSA probably covers the spread of 24 and a half points. I wouldn't be surprised. We lost a penalty by touchdown. And then we lost a few other massive gains by a penalty as well. Uh, The other thing, Jared, um, we're getting down towards the end of the game. Uh, I guess the most important moment is we have a turnover. Um, Whenever it's just a one possession game, it's about halfway through the fourth quarter. And Kennesaw State just takes over after UTSA three and out. Mind you, there's three three and outs in a row in the second half going from the third to the fourth quarter by the UTSA offense, three, three and outs in a row. Talk about immaturity, not being able to recover from the lull. This is a probably the scariest part of the game. If you're watching it from home and then on Kennesaw, uh, Kennesaw's ensuing drive after the third, three and out fumble recovery. Um, it's forced uh, by, was it, uh, it was the Stanford Jimmy transfer. Warwick. Jimmy Wyrick. He had a great game. Cyrus Dumas recovers it. Uh, beautiful, beautiful work. And that essentially seals it for UTSA. They take over in scoring po- position right there, I guess, probably on a 30-yard line and punch it in, right? Touchdown. Jared, uh, that moment, I think, really saved the Roadrunners. You knew the talent was going to show up and get us out of that situation that we were in. Um, really, really fantastic stuff from the mm-hmm. UTSA defense. Yeah, for, for me, I – when that drive started, I was like, 
who's getting the interception, right? Like I had total confidence that UGSA was going to get a turnover of their own at that point in time. And then it, it was like on the first play, it was a force fumble. Like it was kind of kind of uncanny for sure. Um, yeah. Sometimes that's how the game of football goes, man. Turnovers come in bunches, right? Whether it's the same team or, or the opponent, uh, you know, swapping back and forth between the two teams. But yeah. Um, Adrian, I do want to take a quick moment to recognize some of our Patreon subscribers. We'll do a commute break and then come back and share some more of our thoughts. Uh, but I do want to shout out Digitique, John Otwell, Gary and Ruben referencing the UTC Bird Gang Tailgate, Ray Redding and Mimi Apparel, Brandon Grill and the Grill Realty Group, Andy Elizada Proficient Benefit Solutions. A uh, huge shout out to Andy, by the way. He created a new track for us to use on our Patreon episode so we can differentiate between the free episode and the bonus episode. So be on the lookout for that for our bonus episode this week. And thank you, Andy. You're an absolute legend for that. Thank you as well to Ian McClendon and Secret LLC. Ryan Squares, Waterman Construction, Javon Townsend, President of the DFW Chapter of the UTC Alumni Association, UTC Annual Giving, Artisan Vapor and CBD, and Wayne Gonzalez on Runners Rising Project. Got to meet, see a lot of these guys out in the tailgate lots uh, this past Saturday. So thank you. And if we didn't get a chance to, to meet, you know, hopefully we'll see you in San Marcos or, or later this season. But yeah, we'll go ahead and kick, kick it over to a quick combi break and we'll be back to share the rest of our thoughts from UTSA's Game 1 performance. All right, folks, welcome back. Hope you guys enjoyed the Gumbia break. Uh, so, Adrian, before we get started with the, the final segment of the show here, uh, maybe we should talk about this at the beginning. Maybe it would have been a better fit. But from your perspective, what was the environment like in the Alamo Dome this year, you know, maybe compared to season openers of the past? And I tell you what, I was really impressed with considering the opponent that we had. Usually Kennesaw State does not get anybody out to the Alamo Dome or a school of that caliber, I suppose I should say. Even if it's week one or not, not many people are going out to that game. But even whenever we made it to the tailgate lots and we got there early to be mm -hmm. live at the Alumni Association tailgate at the SB, which thank you guys so much for having us. The uh, setup was unbelievable. Really yeah, top it really notch, was very pro nice, level man. stuff from the Alumni yep. Association. And dude, the lots, the lots, we got there. I got there at about 11 o'clock, 11, 15. The parking lots were filled packed they looked fantastic people everywhere students at the game two and a half three hours before kickoff which is not something that you would usually even see at the tailgate that early uh you do there was like just a lot of people that saw a lot of volume you know when we got inside man i tell you what i think once upon a time jared utsa was, was a school where a lot of kids went home for labor day weekend that was not the case this Saturday, Dude, this past that Saturday, was Alamo, packed and rocking, brother. Student section was top to bottom, completely filled, rocking up and down. It was a glorious sight to behold. Big shout out to the student section. It looks like the Alamo was doing some construction on their second level. So yeah, the, yeah, I the, want to talk about the, that. The bodies were even more compact and concentrated. I mean, like every single seat was taken up because they had less mm -hmm. less availability for their seating, right? And you saw a yeah, lot for, of students out there. So that was that was a pretty awesome scene. For those that don't know, like if you look at the Almadome seating chart, like that uh that end zone corner of the club level is reserved for student seating, right? And that whole section is closed for construction as they do the final four renovations for the Almadome, right? Uh so I didn't even realize that heading into the game. And I got to my seat early, you know, just like Adrian said, we were early for everything. And the yeah. student section was already like 70% full. And I'm like, oh my Packed. god, we're gonna we're gonna have to turn students away from Memphis, right? Like if the season goes the way we wanted to, absolutely yeah. packed. Oh yeah, oh yeah, man. They're, or they're gonna have to figure out somewhere else that they can put them and expand it and put them. But they need to be I, in I've there. I've seen and, in the past, like I, I think when we hosted Oklahoma State, they like ran out of student season seating, and they just like told the kids just go sit wherever. <laughs> like so I think it was really yeah yeah just go sit wherever is fine. That's a great rule. And dude, I thought it was beautiful. Because all of those bottom row seats were filled up, and there was a button every seat, and it was yeah. like uh, it looks so good. Almost looked like a mosh pit down there. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. all just stacked on top of each other. They're getting ruckus. Everyone's yeah. standing, no looking like a Travis out. Scott concert. Yeah, it looked like a it looked like a proper college football student section with a, right. with like the that much density, the the population density of that section. Dude, also, I'll tell you, Jared. You I'll, I'll, all right, I'll, I'll say my point. Go ahead, <laughs> dude. The, speaking of the upstairs, that was somewhere that I sat with my friend group every single year as a student at UTSA. We would go to the club level of the student section, 
and sit on the first one or two levels because you could never get the first or rows. I'm sorry. You could never get the first two rows in the actual bottom level of the student section. But if you went up to the club level, you could go first two rows and be, we, we had our flags come and take it and UTSA mm. hanging over the banisters. Everyone would sit up there. So I know it's a spot for students to go and frequent as well. Kind of sucks that it's closed down. I just wanted to echo your point. Yeah. And, you know, speaking of the student section being packed, the students as well as the whole stadium understood the assignment with the orange out. That was super encouraging, right? Like the fact that we could properly pull off like a color game as fans yeah. and we can pull 26 K for Kennesaw state. We've come a long way, right? The fan base is getting more and more hardcore, which is awesome to see. We're still a long ways away from it being able to do like, uh, you know, with the stripe ones that like Iowa and Penn state do. But that's something that we can aspire to, right? Like that was great to see. I, I remember in the past they had like a whiteout game, and like you couldn't even buy white UTSA gear anywhere. So people were yeah. like wearing like, <laughs> yeah. you know, tank tops <laughs> and stuff that were not UTSA branded. <laughs> so that was awesome to see, man. Great, great job by loo. fans. Great job by UTSA's marketing team and all that to push that out. That was awesome. I, I had zero expectation. Like I had a, uh, Aaron actually messaged that morning. He's like, oh man, I don't have any white gear. Do you think I'm going to be the only one? And everyone's like, no, nah, you know, it's going to be 30% of the crowd in, in the wrong color, but it, it was really solid. That was, that was great. So 26,000 fans at Kennesaw state home opener or not, I think is just unbelievable. Uh, really, really great kudos. Yeah. The orange I'll, out. I'll say, man, I'm, I'm disappointed in Kennesaw, dude. They brought like, I thought they were going to have a couple 30 of fans. fans. There's, 30 max, dude. I mean, you couldn't hear well, them. It, it, you couldn't, it you like could not hear them bucks, at all. 200 bucks to fly from Atlanta to Austin or San Antonio. It's your FBS opener. No one was you out there. Yeah, the no one walk. was out there. My no state brought more fans to the Alamo Dome than Kennesaw State did. Oof. Rough, man. And like, really, I know really that they show. have a solid fan base. Like, They get good attendance at their games, right? But that was disheartening to see. I really yeah. expected more. Not that I expected, I you know, they're going to fill up the whole visitor section or anything. But yeah, that was that was disappointing. I agree. I agree with you. Orange out was really a phenomenal success. I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah, I saw a lot of and dude. And orange is not an easy color to come by. No, you know. So yeah, shout out for San Antonio outlets making that available. Yeah, though, I, mean, though, though I will say, on our own store, we don't even have a lot on our own store because like most vendors don't do a lot of orange because it doesn't sell like you know more more neutral colors do. Yeah, yeah, it just doesn't. It's just not a popular. So yeah, so so shout out to the orange out, man. Always, yeah. always fun. And of course, with the start of a new season, we have a, a new intro song, a new intro video. I loved both of them. I liked them a lot better than what we had last year. Uh, this one, it, it feels more unique to UTSA, more unique to San Antonio. You kind of have like, you know, those Latin horn sounds in there. Um, it got me really pumped up. Uh, looking forward to it. I'm glad they released a video. I'll have to rewatch it. But uh I remember being in the stands and, you know, of course you're a couple beers in, so it's always more exciting than, you know, otherwise, but I thought it was great, man. It, it, it gave it a great vibe and it felt pure San Antonio. Alamo Dome environment was really, really phenomenal overall. It was loud in there. It was ruckus in there. I'll also say the, the, the PA announcing the, the MCing was, was really top notch. Yeah. Um, got the crowd going uh, sometimes. It, it, yeah, I got the crowd really, really going. The soundtrack always gets the Alamo Dome. Yeah, it's, it was good yeah, to be I, back in there. I saw some critiques of the DJ music selection, but it's all like, you know, 40-year-old guys complaining about it. So, you know, I don't know. It didn't bother me much. I was laughing with my friends. Oh, no, they, were, they were playing some oldies. And, one, and when I say oldies, I mean like songs from when I was in middle school. That's an oldie now. But I thought it was fun. Okay. Yeah, no, that's. Uh, I thought it's always good at the Alamo Dome. At one point, there were like six or seven cumbia songs in a row, and we were like, right. there's no other college experience in the world. <laughs> and we were all yeah, high for sure. Yeah, it was, yeah, I mean, come on. It's it's different, man. It's different. Yeah. Uh, Darren, man, we, we got to talk about one glaring issue. Concessions worse than they've ever been, brother. Oh, is that so? I didn't have a bad experience. I paid $24 for two awful tacos and a Pepsi. Uh, there was when one. I, I posted that oh. on Twitter, and a lot of people responded with like even worse stories than mine. No, 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 no. Delete, delete the what I just said about there were no issues. At one point, and I don't know if this went the whole game or not, but nowhere in the stadium had any sort of club soda available whatsoever. And so my buddy went and ordered a drink, and it ended up just being like tequila and sweet and sour. And Ooh. he wanted it with club. They were like, "There's yeah. no club," and they just gave him the tequila. 
<laughs> tequila in the line. And I was like, okay, oh, <laughs> could, like pour Sprite in it or something. Yeah, so I don't know if it was like a an issue with uh, the Alamo Dome soda jerk piping, but there was also Jared none of the televisions, and I don't know if this was true on the lower concourse, but on the upper concourse around the concessions or on the club level where the seating is, there's also oh, like screens the set up around. No TVs on the overhang were playing anything, all turned off, all out, and every single one on the concourse on the club level, all around the concessions, all out, all of them blacked out. Dude, are you kidding me? That, that's highly disappointing to hear. I didn't even realize that. Very Bush League. Very, very Bush League. To be standing you know, I, in line I, I or can... to be eating something and not be able to see what's going on on the game on the TV. Right. I, I can handle poor quality concessions. I get it. I don't go to a ballpark for a gourmet experience. It's nice when you have it. I'm happy to pay for it. Um, and I also understand that there's gonna always going to be a premium, right, if, if you're eating in a stadium. I totally understand that. Yeah. But yeah. when it's both and that premium is ridiculous, I'm not worried about myself because I can make other choices. But if you have a family and you're trying to feed your children of the game, like I, I know how that is, right? You can't tell your kids like, no, I'm not going to feed you for three hours if they're hungry, right? And when you have that kind of concessions experience, it's just going to turn families away and it's really going to hurt attendance, right? That's a huge portion of UTSA's attendance, right? Especially from the non-alumni, yeah. non right? People that, uh, you know, maybe they're not even from San Antonio. They moved here. They want to take their kids to a sporting event, to a Division One football game. You know, they buy cheap tickets. They go and, you know, they got to feed their kids, right? Um, if it's seen that UTSA football is not a family-friendly event that has a great value, it's going to hurt attendance, right? And I know UTSA doesn't have a lot of ability to fix that because the city runs the concession stands. They set the prices and all that, but it's not benefiting every, anyone, right? And it's only going to drop uh, the revenue, right, from that if they don't get it fixed. You, you can't be charging Eras Tour prices for crappy tacos when UTSA is playing Kennesaw State, right? So something's got to change. Mm -hmm. And um, I hope, like, all the negativity on social media around that leads to some positive change. Yeah, let's hope so. Let's hope so. Jared, I bet you never thought you'd get a, an Arrows Tour reference on the Alma Audible. Oh, dude, I, I, I think it's fantastic. And it's something that needs to be said. If anyone's going to push for change, it's going to be us. Um, you know, there's a lot of things I could gripe about. Uh, another thing that is going to decrease attendance numbers and it's going to make for a bad game day atmosphere and experience is UTSA getting 10 penalties throughout the game for 109 <laughs> yards. Damn, that's one, a professional segue, man. We're back, dude. One, We're so back. One, Next season four, baby. We're ready for conference one, play. One giving Kennesaw State uh, a first down on third and 14, uh, one negating a touchdown, another one negating a first down big play. I mean, it's just it's just brutal. Jared Did you so revisit – did you revisit the holding call on Cardenas on the Henderson touchdown? I didn't actually I watched, see a replay of it. I watched it, it several times, and I, I never saw holding. But the camera angle that really would have showed if there was holding or not did not get shown on the broadcast. Okay. And I heard from friends that sat on that side of the stadium that was like, yeah, it probably was holding, but nine times out of ten, the, the ref's not going to whistle it. it. Like, it did not affect whether that was a score or not. Yeah. So that was really frustrating. Yeah. It, it, that's it's what more it looked like for in real time. that – you take kind of dilute the moment for a, a true freshman. That's his first touch in college, and it gets taken back. It reminds me of when Brett Winnegan had that uh, kickoff return against like Arizona, Arizona State. Would have been the first kickoff return in program history, and it got called back for a penalty that was like twenty yards away from the actual return. Sucks. Right? It sucks. sucks. Yeah. Well, that's what it looked like in real time because it looked like the flag was on a different part of the field from where the ball was actually going, and so that I think uh, it caused a little bit of uproar whenever the penalty flag was initially thrown for that reason. Jared, uh, the penalties snowballed into a lot of other mistakes for the Roadrunners. Uh, we saw a few poor displays of offense, namely in uh, the pass protection department, which we talked about a little bit. Um, you attribute it a lot to just poor offensive line play. Uh, what did you see there? I saw three starters that have never played football together trying to figure each other out and get the communication down. That was my main takeaway. Like I said earlier in the show, it wasn't like guys were getting bull rushed and knocked over. It's not like guys didn't have the quickness to keep up with linebackers blitzing off the edge, right? It was like purely communication. 
Um, and sometimes it was just a numbers game. Like Kennesaw State was very aggressive with their blitz, and sometimes they had more blitzers than UDC had blockers, right? You can't hold up against that. So it was it was a myriad of issues, right? Um, which is good and bad, I guess, because like the worst thing would have been like, yeah, these guys just suck. And that's not that was not my takeaway, right? I think all five starters um, have the ability to be really good in pass protection, right? Um, I, for me, I think my main complaint was with CJ James, right? That play where he let the Mike linebacker come right through the A gap was really brutal. Uh, that's got to go. He had some issues and in, in run blocking as well. Um, but like I said earlier, I'm not concerned about that long term. Um, I know that there were some missed blocks from running backs as well at pass protection, which makes sense yeah. because they had you know Brandon High out there, they had Will Henderson out there, um, just a lot of rotation, right? And I think that also had a part to play uh, in the bad pass protection. So yeah, it's disappointing. But uh, again, too, I mean, I do want to get some credit to Kennesaw State. They were very you know uh, sound in their discipline. Um, they pursued the ball They're really well. They took good angles, Super right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it, yeah. you know, we're going to face other teams that are like that as well. Um, but I think most teams that we play probably won't be as good on defense as Kennesaw State was. So um, I'm trying not to overreact to it, but I can see where you would be like, oh, it's Kennesaw State. Like these guys are barely D1. You know, you got to do better. And, and that's right. Right. I'm not trying to dispute that. But um, I, I'm not sitting here panicking, thinking like, how the hell are they, these guys going to block AAC schools in a, a couple of weeks? Right. I, I think they're going to be okay. So would you attribute the the running game issues to that same sort of reasoning? Because, I don't know, it looked like on a lot of those run plays, there were decent-sized holes for the running backs to get through. Yeah, yeah, there were uh, some. But, dude, we did not translate into yardage by what is supposed to be one of the most talented running back rooms in the country, definitely the conference. Uh, the, that talented running room didn't get many snaps, Adrian. 15 snaps across the big three. Running backs – in particular, need more volume to get going. I think, um, especially like throughout a game, you yeah. got to give them at least 20, 25 carries. Owen McGowan being asked to back up 38 times in his first start versus a run game that you know is very experienced as a, as a lot of snaps underneath their belt, all of them. Yeah, that seems um, like not the right balance that we want to see from this offense. And a lot of that was schematic, right? Kennesaw did put a lot of guys in the box, right? So, you know, I, I don't like running into a loaded box just to say that you're running the ball. Like, that's not smart either. But, no, my complaint more was, like, with the distribution of touches, right? Um, yeah. A part, you know, the more I sit on it, the more I think of it is, like, they want to see what they got with these other guys, right? And they're going to have to find ways to get all these guys some touches, but, uh, you know, we, we mentioned a lot in the, in the preseason. We don't know how they're going to be able to balance all the talent in that room and, and keep everyone happy. And, uh, you know, Saturday to me was an indication of that, right? I, I think the running game would have been better if Robert Henry had five more touches, if Kivorian Barnes yeah. had five more touches, right? If Robert yeah, Griffin had five eight, more touches. There's eight touches that go to uh, Brandon High, Willie Henderson, and Bryson Donald. There's eight touches that go to those guys that, yeah, you could disperse better amongst the, your other big three. Yeah. Sure. But, you know, again, like, we're not complaining about this if you take away five penalties because this game is a blowout and those younger yeah. guys get the experience, right? So um, I think we'll see a tighter rotation against Texas State. And another con criticism I had, man, is like, yeah, Will Henderson had that, you know, 75, 65-yard run or whatever. So, like, you got to give him another touch. But they had two three and outs, and the, the next – Drive after that, they ran between the tackles three times, and a true freshman mm, that like mm, was what mm. like a buck eighty gets all three of the carries. I I didn't like the game was too tight for that in that situation. I I didn't like that call. Yeah, and how about sitting Kavorian Barnes uh, after the fumble? You know that seems like you're in a situation where you probably need to get him back in the game and get some of those big boy yards. That's probably the yeah. guy that you know can do it more reliably than anybody yeah. else. Um, Jeff Trailer talking about Kavorian Barnes who had. A couple of fumbles at the beginning of last season. He had three fumbles last year. And he says it's his style of running. He goes and looks for the contact. He'll have the first down. He said in this situation, the fumble, he had the first down. And then he went looking for trouble. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it, it is, it is on the opening drive. That, that was so cool. But it was, a, no it was a big boy that. moment. It was a welcome yeah. to FBS football moment. Uh, yep. But, yeah, he, he, he goes looking for it, sure. Uh, but it looked like something that really bothered Jeff Trailer when he was asked about it because it's probably something that he's talked to Kaborian a lot. He was about. very deliberate with his words without response. 
Yes. Did, yes like, sir. don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So I don't know. Um, I totally get benching Kivorian for that. Right. It's been an issue with him in the past. Right. Um, but I, I also would have liked him to have the opportunity to redeem himself in that second half. And I thought that drive in particular, where they gave those carries to Henderson would have been a great time for it. And I, I honestly think that Kivorian could have iced the game on that drive because like there was one yeah. uh, split zone play they ran where um, CJ James got blown up by the nose tackle. He got pushed back into Oscar. So Oscar had to go around CJ to get his block, still got his block. And Kamar Missouri, a left tackle, had an awesome seal block to kick out the defensive tackle. So there was a big hole there. And Henderson just ran to the, probably to the gap that he should have been, like per play call, but he went nowhere. If he would have been a little bit more patient and then taken the outside of, uh, like kind of ran off of Oscar's butt and it went to the left, he would have had a first down, maybe could have scored. And it makes me wonder if Kivorian would have seen that, taken that route, got the first down, maybe made a bigger play, kept kept the sticks moving, right? So, um, you know. So part of me is like, it's, you know, they wanted to get the young guys some experience in this game. It made the game closer than expected, but maybe this is the strategy for this year, right? We'll just have to see how it turns out. Yeah. Yeah, definitely so. So, yeah, we had a... Well, hold on, hold well, on. I, I feel bad we've been negative about Henderson. I feel like we got we got to give him his kudos, man. His, he should have his, his, should have jet, his, flowers, sweep, yeah. his jet sweep. His jet sweep, his first touch was the most impressive display of speed I've ever seen on the field from a UTSA roadrunner. Shoo. Yeah, I mean, he just He's gone. flew. He, he really, different really level. Flew. Different level. That was, when I was watching USC and LSU last night, I was like, Will Henderson's as fast as some of these guys, and I've never been able to say that before. It was incredible. Yeah, it was, it's it was just a different level. Thing to see. Different level. No. Yeah. So how 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 do you want to see him use this year though? Because he's not going to redshirt. It looked like that was a fun package to put him in. Um, I'd still like to see him somewhat limited on his snaps. But if we're in a situation like that, where if you got to, you know, look, Willie 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 Henderson had three carries on the day. Um. If if he's going to be your fourth guy, your fourth running back, I don't know. He might be like a a guy who sees just as much carries as Rocco Griffin does. They could be getting the same amount of carries. Again, yep. when you see Robert Robert Henry and Kavoria Barnes doing the loin share, and then giving a couple of those specialty packages to Rocco as well as to Willie Henderson, I could maybe see something like that where you see him consistently on a couple of those special packages. Okay. With that sort of speed, yeah, I could see them burning the red shirt, and I have no problem with them doing that. I guess we'll see if, if he goes into the game against consequence, um, whether that's true or not. Yeah, I feel like he will. And I think he's too fast. I think you got to use him. He's got that home run threat so. ability. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm curious to Definitely see. So. But I don't know if running between the tackles three times in a row is is the move. <laughs> Now, you know, some yeah. of those probably were RPO play calls, right? And and Owen had to hand it off because he didn't have to look on the outside. But, yeah, I, I, I just want to see him more outside zone, you know, a pin pull, a, a book sweep, you know, that kind of stuff where he can get up to the edge and, like, really take off. Who else Who else really stuck out to you, Jared, on the offense? Yeah, we got to talk more about Devin McEwen. You know, we mentioned his stat line, but outside of just the raw production, the question going into the season is, like, who's going to step up and be – the go-to target. Everyone is looking to Devin McEwen to do that. And he absolutely delivered sure handed, yeah. you know, he, he found the open grass uh, against zone, right. Uh, when there was an audible, you know, he took that right route. Um, his second touchdown, Kennesaw state again, was not lined up in red zone. Uh, so, you know, Devin, I, I don't know if, you know, that kind of quick slant was the actual route called and play call, but he just like ran because there was no one there caught the touchdown pass. Um, also, so one yeah. play where there was an outside linebacker or safety that crept up to blitz and Devin kind of called out to Owen to let him know about the blitz. And again, that's mm. a true sophomore, right? To have that kind of football IQ, to have that kind of leadership on the offense, like that stuff that we've seen from Josh Chiefus in the past. So to see him kind of have that, um, you know, kind of intangible uh, impact to the offense was really awesome to see. That's incredible. Already spotting things and being able to relay it. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I think it was fantastic seeing him and Owen's chemistry. Clearly, they're they're going to be um, a force to be reckoned with, and, and that's going to be his number one guy. And that was sort of what we were talking about. I think everyone was sort of predicting that 
But yeah, they, they clearly already have a little bit of that chemistry, a little bit of that synchronicity together. And uh, yeah, a big things to come from that too. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of the, the new transfers, that was a big takeaway for me too. Um, it looks like UTSA really knocked it out of the park with this group of transfers that they brought in, right? I'm going to run through some guys real quick. Uh, DJ Allen had a huge catch. Mm. It would have been a touchdown, but the turf monster got him. He tripped up. Yes. A oh, um, l- yeah. little concerned about the turf situation in the Alma Dome, by the way. Okay. I, I hear that it's five years old, which is like within lifespan, but there's a lot of high school games that get played on that turf too, which has me wondering mm-hmm. if, you know, maybe so the turf needs some attention. Yeah. Keep an eye on that. Um, but yeah, DJ Allen, great game. But on the defense, you know, and obviously like the offensive line, right? You got three starters up there, all transfers, some struggles, especially on CJ James's part. But, you know, they they were out there starting for a reason. They all had good plays individually. They're going to gel together. They're going to do great. Uh, Brevin Randall played a ton of snaps. So he's going to take transfer to inside linebacker. Um, again, you know, he had one really bad play where there was like a, I think a delayed release. Um Oh, like a swing route or something from a running back. Yeah. Um, Brevin didn't pick it up. And then when the ball was thrown, he then took a bad angle, couldn't catch up. So that that was really bad to see, um, especially because I think he is pretty good in coverage. So hopefully he gets mm-hmm. that cleaned up. But he was very physical. Uh, he hurdled an offensive guard and like was a split second away from a sack at one play. So yeah. he was about to pull a Josiah. Yeah, right. So that was awesome. Uh, Bryce Grays played great. You know, Donya Taylor was out with an undisclosed injury. Hopefully he's back mm-hmm. this week. Uh, but Bryce Gray spread well. Uh, Marcellus Wilkerson was not a transfer this year, but he had an awesome game. Stepped up big time as well. Just want to make sure he got a shout out. Uh, Jimmy Wyrick had the play of the game. The Stancer transfer Jimmy at Wyrick. safety. That's right. Kendrick Blackshaw. Everyone's going to remember his late hit out of bounds, but he played well. He had a pass breakup as well. Which, <laughs> you know, And that's one of the things that we said about him is like we're concerned that he's too big. He can't move to the sideline. You know, They're going to go right after him and all that. And then we saw in the first right. game, right? He went and he went almost all the way to the sideline and broke with pass. That, almost intercepted. That so that was great to see. Yeah. Denver yeah. Harris. Big time. Denver Harris did his thing. He looks the part. You know, the cornerbacks didn't really get tested a whole lot because Kennesaw's quarterback didn't have much arm strength. Um, but you know, he looked he looked good out there for sure. Uh Denver Harris was a scare trying to make an unnecessary hard pop on his first tackle. Yeah. It was a real yeah, runner. If, uh, if but I it was turned that out size, being okay. I'd, I'd be trying to to take some heads yeah, off. Yeah, he was well. tr- yeah, he was trying to take some heads off. So yeah, I mean I that, that was sort of another display though of, of the just way too much juice running for this new team playing together for the first time. Uh, yeah. but yeah, that was uh good to see Dimmer staying okay and uh well, yeah, you you saw his talent shine, definitely. And then last but, guy you know, too, there, there, there was oh I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say last guy too kind of flew under the radar a little bit, but Damien Wimberly from SMU played a pretty good amount and he had a tackle that was close to a sack. He had some pretty good pass rush moves. I'm feeling good about yeah. him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But uh, that said, there was a little bit of busted coverage on defense. You know, I think Kennesaw State and uh, threw for about four or five yards over 20 passes. Davis Davis Bryson threw for over 20 yard, uh, over five, five over 20 yard passes. So, yeah, those big completions sort of happening on these busted defensive coverages. And I would say probably similar to what you're talking about, Jared, about the offensive line, miscommunication between the defensive backs, trying to figure some things out, and then also frustration from the penalties. Uh, but, yeah, look. I thought the, I thought the coverage said, was good. I thought the coverage was good. Yeah. I'm going to be honest, right? Um, the the one touchdown they had, when I went back and broke that down, it was, it was just the perfect play call for what UTC had on defense in, in that mm-hmm. moment, right? Like, yes, the safety made the wrong read. Probably should have picked up the tight end, but even if they would have made yeah. the right read, it still would have been a very, very, very tough assignment. And you know, play calling it's like rock paper scissors, right? Sometimes like the other team calls a perfect counter to what you call, and that's football, right? And that's going to happen a few times a game. But overall, I was I was really happy with the coverage. Actually, like some of those uh, bigger yeah. plays, it's just like one missed tackle or whatever. Um, I did not see like massive breakdowns in communication like we have seen from the UTSA secondary in the past. And with all the new faces, um, that's really good. I, I thought the safeties in particular were amazing. Elliot Davison, Ken Robinson, Jimmy Wyrick. I think those three guys, you know, a sample size of one game. But what I saw from the safeties has me feeling really good that this may be the deepest we've been at safety. 
maybe had a lot ever, of speed. Right? That's for sure. You you, you saw a yeah, lot of and, speed and hard hits too. Like they're small guys, the but backs. you know, uh, yeah. Obviously, Wyrick forced the fumble, but uh, Elliot Davison had a massive hit as well on the sideline. So that's awesome to see. One overall great game from the defense. You know, you hold them just 16 yards. Uh, most of them come that by way of field goal. Um, you only had really blown uh, uh, mental errors on defense, which gave them chain movement by way of penalties and yeah. flags. Uh, but you only hold them to actually 200 yards of total offensive production, hardly over 200. Um, and so, yeah, look, it was, a, it, was, it was a good day for UTSA. 253 total yards for Kennesaw State. But UTSA's defense had a good day. Jeff Trailer did talk about there were some uh, busted coverages due to miscommunication. And so you're mm-hmm. really just seeing a lot of just early newcomer issues uh, with, with the team that's playing together for the first time. I think yeah. they're going to be okay. Um, we, but, this is not a good but, test, though. This is not a good test. Look, Next week is the test to see how the secondary really is. I think it's fair. For Jeff Trailer to give this um, a D minus on controlling mental toughness, uh, I would probably agree with him. That is a culture pillar of the mm-hmm. triangle of toughness. A D minus on controlling mental toughness, and we did not uphold the two one zero triangle of toughness culture due to that D minus on the mental toughness. So yeah, we got to see that cleaned up, Jared. Here's the good thing for Roadrunners fans. Texas State had just a, as sloppy of a game against yeah. Lamar last week at um, Bobcat Stadium in San Marcos. They actually had 16 penalties occur and only <laughs> beat Lamar by way of one possession, eight points, I think, 37 to 45. And so uh, who can correct more of their mistakes quicker? That's who's going to win next week. I've only watched the first half of that game so far. So, like, I've only seen, like, the good half for Texas State. I'm really curious to watch the second half because, like, on paper, UTSA played a better game against a better opponent than Texas State did. And that's not that's not what the, the spread shows in Vegas, and that's not, like, what the sentiment um, across the fan base is either. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited to watch that uh, second half and then also have two more episodes for you guys this week. Uh, first, our bonus episode with the Texas State guest. That'd be great. Back my copy of The Demand. You know, no, no spoilers on that. Uh, and then also, you know, we're going to do our own preview episode as well on the regular feed. So, you know, but extra content this week for Texas State. It's a huge game. Biggest game in the rivalry so far. I can't imagine there's a game that Texas State fans have anticipated more than this one, like for a generation of Bobcat fans. Oh, yeah. That's going to be huge. Oh, yeah. Massive game. Be in San Marcos. Be there. You must be there. Uh, we'll have more on your Texas State preview later this week. Shout out to our big money donors. Before we get out of here, that is Ben Tovar, the Bunch family, Zach Espericueta, and the San Antonio Podcast Network, Alejandro Benavides, Dan Nernal, host of Around the Bird Bath for Alamo Audible, Jacob Cavazos, board president for the UTSA Alumni Association. Big thank you to the Alumni Association for having us out last Saturday. Yeah, John Nally, Rick Cortez of Rowdy Road Grillers, Summer McDaniel, UTSA King Bowser, and Home Field Apparel, you can finally get the Vintage Rowdy logo collection. Use discount code UTSA once home field, and you can save 15% off your first order. You can also send some support to the podcast while you save. So please do. And uh, thank you guys very, very much for joining us on the Kennesaw State recap. A lot to be concerned about, a lot to be excited about, guys.